Okay, welcome back. Uh, today is part two of our new series where I'm going over terms, definitions, and then giving a practice question example. So welcome back um, to everybody. Hope you've been studying hard. If you're enjoying the videos, like, subscribe, um, helps me out. You can also find all our study materials uh, at our website or at one of the following links. I'll put all those links in the descriptions and the comments below. Um, other than that, let's get into it. Okay, we're gonna cover A3, A4, and A5 today. So discontinuous measurement, uh, permanent product, and graphing. So let's start with discont discontinuous measurement, which gives people a lot of trouble. Um, it's, it's kind of a hard concept to grasp at first, but once you understand it, it becomes very simple. So when we talk about discontinuous measurement, we're talking about partial interval, whole interval, and momentary time sampling. And the reason it's discontinuous is because measurement only happens for a part of the day, okay? It's only a selected interval of the day. When we're doing continuous measurement like duration frequency, we're taking data throughout the entire day. For discontinuous measurement, all right, you're picking out, you know, 10, 15, 20 minutes and recording what happens during that time, okay? You then take that 15, 20 minutes and you break it into intervals, thus the term interval, okay? So for partial interval, if the behavior happens at any point during those intervals you chose, you record a response, okay? So if my intervals are 30 seconds and the behavior happens at all during those 30 seconds, it counts as a response, okay? So let's look at an example. You're measuring how often your client raises their hand. Each interval is 30 seconds. The intervals went as follows. 0 to 30, the first 30 seconds, there are two hand raises. The second 30 seconds, zero hand raises. The third 30 seconds, five hand raises. And the fourth, zero hand raises. Okay, so we had two, zero, five, zero. So we had four intervals total, right? Um, and a response happened in two of those. So if we're recording how many responses, what would you choose? Okay, would you choose seven? Would you choose zero? Would you choose two? Or would you choose five? So we're using partial int interval. If the behavior happened at all, we record a response. So look at our first one, two hand raises. The behavior happened, one response. Second, zero, no responses. The behavior didn't happen. Third, five hand raises. The behavior happened, we record a response. Lastly, zero, zero. So that would come out to be 50%, okay? Now notice the total number didn't matter, okay? Five and two didn't matter because we're looking at interval data, okay? We just want to know, did it happen during the interval or did it not? So in this case, partial interval, our answer would be we record two, to two total responses. It happened two out of the four intervals or 50% of the time. Okay, whole interval, same idea. We're doing discontinuous measurement. We're picking out a time, okay, set a, set a time and then breaking it into intervals. This time for a whole interval, it, the behavior has to happen the entire interval for the whole interval that you record a response, okay? So if the behavior doesn't happen the entire time, we don't record it, all right? So question, you are measuring on task behavior. Each interval is 15 seconds. The interval went as follows. First 15 seconds, 15 seconds. Second 15 seconds, 15 seconds. Third 15 seconds, only 12 seconds. Fourth 15, the entire time. So if we're using whole interval data, how many responses do you record? Is it three, zero, four, or two? Well, let's look at our data, okay? Whole interval, we need it to happen the entire time. So the first 15 seconds, it happened 15 seconds. Yes. Second 15 happened 15. Yes. Third 15 only happened 12. The behavior happened, but not during the entire time. Therefore, we do not record it. Finally, the last time it happened the entire 15. So what do we get? We get 75%. Okay. We get three out of four, right? So how many responses are we gonna record? One, two, three. We're going to record 
three responses. So whole interval tends to underestimate data, right? Because remember, the behavior happened quite a bit, even in this third interval, but because it didn't happen the entire time, it doesn't count. So we're underestimating how often the behavior occurs. Discontinuous measurement is less accurate than continuous measurement, okay? Because you're only getting a sample of the data. All right, momentary time sampling. Our final discontinuous measurement, same idea. We pick out a portion of time, we break it into intervals and we start recording, okay? Momentary time sampling could be good when you're in a group and you have a group of kids and you can only record data on each one, okay, every so often. So if the behavior happens at the end of the interval, you record a response. So let's say you pick, you pick 20 second intervals, you would set a timer and at 20 seconds, if the behavior happens, you record a response at 40, at 60, so on, okay? So question, you are teaching a class of five. Every one minute, you look up from your desk to see if Bob has his hand raised. The intervals went as follows, okay? So you're at your desk, every one minute you look up to see if Bob has his hand raised. So if the end of your intervals at every one minute, if the behavior is happening at that time, you record it. Let's see. First minute, no. Second minute, no. Third minute, yes, hand was raised at that time. Fourth minute, no. So what does this say? It says that Bob could have had his hand raised, okay, for the first 30 seconds of this interval, but that's not what we're looking at. We're looking at the very end of that interval. When you look up and see, is the hand raised or not? So how many responses do we record for momentary time sampling? Well, this one's easy, right? Because we're just looking at the very end. So we only have a total of one response, one out of four, okay, 25%, okay, therefore one response. So you can see discontinuous measurement, okay, why it would be more or less, I'm sorry, less accurate than continuous, okay? Because you're only getting a portion of what's really going on, okay? Um, so you're not getting the entire picture, right? But it's still useful in certain situations, okay? So take these examples, right? They're, they're straightforward examples, um, but you can see why the accuracy of discontinuous measurement can be a little misleading. Okay, let's get an A4, permanent product. Again, something that's very simple and straightforward, but it's a little tough to grasp at first, okay? Permanent product recording, you're looking at what the behavior produces, a concrete outcome of behavior. The key is you don't have to observe the behavior to measure and record permanent product. So for continuous measurement, discontinuous measurement, we actually need to watch the behavior happen. We have to see it happen. For permanent product, our behavior is producing something as a concrete outcome where I can come back in two hours and record what happened as a result of the behavior. Common examples, test. If you take a test, I can come back and see how you did. Worksheet, I can look at the worksheet after you've done it and see how you did. A clean room, if I tell you, go clean your room, I can go check five hours later. I don't have to watch you clean it. I see that it's clean. Completing a checklist, I give you a list of items from the grocery store. You pick those up, okay? I can come back from work eight hours later and check to see if you got everything. I don't have to watch you go to the store, buy everything, et cetera. I can just come back and check your behavior produced all those items, okay? Your behavior produced that test. All right, permanent product. Very, very simple, right? Don't complicate it. Whatever the behavior produces, it has to be concrete, okay? So a tantrum, I can't measure a tantrum, right? If it doesn't produce anything because I wasn't there to see it. So it has to produce something that I can look at and record afterwards, okay? Question, your BCBA instructs you to work on fine motor skills with your client. You're supposed to save all writing and tracing worksheets to show the BCBA when they provide supervision. What type of measurement is this? So your BCBA implements a fine motor skill program. You've been working on fine motor skills. 
the BCBA is obviously not there at every session. You are. So they're not actually watching them write and trace and do fine motor, right? So what are they asking you to do? They want you to save what that skill is producing. In this case, writing and tracing worksheets. That way they can come back behind you, okay, every week or every other week, look at the worksheets, compare the worksheets, compare the product, the permanent product, and measure, okay, what kind of progress they're making. So what type of measurement is this? Is this rate? No, there's no frequency involved, no time involved. A latency? No, we're not measuring the time in between an instruction and a response. Permanent product? Yes. What are we measuring? We're measuring the writing and tracing worksheets, okay? The BCBA is not there watching the behavior, but they are measuring the outcome, the product, okay? So see, permanent product, and we just went over whole interval. We know it's not whole interval. It's easy as that, okay? Permanent product is not more complicated than that. Do not make it more complicated than it has to be. All right, last one, graphs, okay? Again, graphs, people freak out about graphs, but I'm here to tell you, RBT exam is not going to kill you with graphs, okay? They want you to have a very, 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 very basic knowledge of a graph and a line graph and what it is. It's all they want, okay? Do not get scared about graphing on the exam, I promise, okay? So let's look at a few standard things you need to know. The most common type of ABA graph is a line graph, which we have down here. You can see why it's a line graph, okay? Your data points are connected, you see the line, okay? That's the most common type in ABA. And as an RBT, that's the most common type you'll use. The x-axis, it's down here, it's your horizontal, it's also known as the abscissa. Time goes on the x-axis. So day, session, hour, whatever your time is, goes on the x-axis, passage of time. Y-axis, it's the vertical, it's your ordinate, your behavior, whatever you're tracking goes on the y-axis. So here, frequency of self-injury is your y-axis. Baseline data, data taken before intervention starts. We want to see what the client can and can't do before we start working on it. Maybe we don't need to work on it. Maybe your client has it down, okay? Or maybe we want to decrease the behavior and we want to see where the behavior is at before we get intervention. Where is baseline in this graph? Baseline is right here, okay? This, this line separates our baseline data from our intervention data, okay? This data was taken before intervention starts. And then you can see when intervention started, the behavior decreased. And that's graphing, it's all you need to know, I promise, okay? It's very straightforward, very easy on the test, okay? Don't get overwhelmed by the graphing. So let's ask, see a, a simple graphing question based on the graph, what data was on the x-axis? So you know your x-axis, right? It's your horizontal, okay? It's your y-axis, your vertical. We're looking at the horizontal. What was on the x-axis? Is it the occurrence of behavior? Well, no, because our behavior is here. We're measuring how many times it happened with our y-axis, so A is out. Passage of time, yes, we're looking at our individual days, okay? So the time each day is our time, right? So it's gotta be B. Client's name, no, the client's name is in the title. The behavior we're measuring. No, we're measuring self-injury. Again, up here, x-axis, horizontal, you record time. Okay, that's it for today. Um, again, three concepts that give people trouble, but once you get a hang of them, they become very simple, very straightforward. Um, so usually I put out these videos on Friday. I'm doing it one day early. Next week, it'll be out on Friday again. I hope you're enjoying it. Like, subscribe. If you are, it helps me. Check out the study materials, um, and I'll be back next week. In the meantime, any questions, email me. Leave a comment below. I'm always happy to help. Always happy to answer. Uh, keep studying hard.